It's summer fun in Malibu. Come on, everyone's at the beach. You know, we got to learn to live with the times and the seasons. We know in summer, Malibu rolls around. It gets, it's our downtime. People are out doing their thing. But it's an important season. And you know, one of the things we believe is that we have to learn to live with the times and the seasons. And we've entered into a new biblical month on the calendar. And the biblical month is known as Tammuz. Can you say Tammuz? And this every biblical month has a sense associated with it, as well as one of the 12 tribes associated. In this month, the sense is the ability to see through. Can you say see through? In the summertime, as we enter into the beginning of the summer season on the biblical calendar, it's this idea of sight, this ability to see through, to see past the physical external realities to the deeper spiritual underlying uh, causes that are beyond these things. And so this is a season in which we are, a month in which we're focusing on sight in order to see past the outer shell of reality, in order to reveal the inner fruit, the inner spirituality. So, of course, this month is associated with the tribe of Reuben. Why? Because Reuben's name literally means to see. And so, again, this idea of associated with sight. And... It says in Deuteronomy 33, 28, it says, Betach bedad ayin Yaakov. Sure alone is the eye of Jacob. Can you say betach? It's the word for sure there. And this is seen as an acronym for three things that we have to learn to see. The ba is bracha. Can you say bracha? Blessing. Okay. Blessing. The T is tov. Can you say tov? That's goodness, okay? And the ha, can you say ha without spinning on your neighbors? Chaim, which is life. So in this summer season, what we have to learn to see is we have to learn to see the blessing. We have to learn to see God's goodness. And we have to learn to see God's life flowing through all things. And so oftentimes it's so easy for us Because God has given us two eyes, right? We can choose to see the eye, the good eye, the good, the blessing, the the spirituality, the life, or we could choose to see through the negative eye. And Helen Keller said, the worst thing in life is not to be born blind, but to be born with sight and have no vision. You You can have the ability to see, and never really perceive or understand. This is a season where we have to really learn to see past the surface, past the external reality. And on the Hebrew calendar, as many of you guys know, we're in the decade of the eyes, that it's a decade in which we're going from hearing the promises of God to learning to see them come to pass. But the truth is we need to see differently if we're going to be different. Because we'll never be more than we can see. We are going to be always limited by our sense of perception and by our ability to see. If you can't see it, you can never be it. And so we're in a season that is about sight, that's without blemish. I mean, it's without, about sight, about vision. It says, my people perish because of a lack of what? And you can't have vision Without emunah, can you say emunah? That's faith. Because when we talk about sight, when we talk about vision, we're always talking about faith. Because what does Hebrews 11 tell us? Faith is a substance of what? The evidence of what? The evidence of things that are not seen. And so if we're going to be people of faith, we have to have the ability to see things that other people can't see, right? Faith, we have to see through the eyes of faith. That's why they're called the eyes of faith. There's things that are not perceptible to the eyes in the natural. But when our spiritual eyes are open, everything begins to be seen differently, 
And so we have to expand our sight, and God wants to expand our vision. So it's no surprise that in the summer where so much emphasis is on sight, that all of the weekly readings from the Torah, from the Hebrew Scriptures, that go back to the days of, of Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus himself, all focus are connected with this idea of vision and sight in one way or another. Numbers chapter 13. This is what it says. Then the, Lord spoke to, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Send out for yourself men so that they might spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm going to give the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, everyone a leader among them. So Moses sent them out from the wilderness of Paran and at the command of the Lord and all the men who were the heads of the sons of Israel. These were their names. And it goes in the list, the names of each of the ones from the 12 tribes. And Moses said to them, spy out the land of Canaan. And he said to them, go up there into the Negev, See what the land is like, what the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. How is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? How are the cities in which they live? Are they open camps or fortification? How is the land? Is it fat or lean? How Are there trees in it or not? Make an effort to get some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the times of the first ripe grapes. And so you know the story. Moses spends, sends his 12 spies into the land. They spy out the land for how many days? 40 days they spy out the land. They come back with this report. They say, man, the land is over. It's a land of milk and honey. It's a prosperous land. It's a blessed land. But they bring, the spies come back. They all agree that it's amazing. But 10 of the 12 spies bring a good report or a bad report? A bad report. They're like, man, the land is awesome, but there's a few issues in there. There's a few problems, so we're not so sure about this land. So 10 bring back a negative report. And two bring back a very positive report about the land. Those two are which two? Who are the two? Joshua and Caleb. How is it possible for 12 people to go in, see the exact same land, to see the exact same thing, and come back with such radically different perspectives? The 10 could only see the negative they could only see the dark cloud, but not the silver lining. They had sight, but they had no vision. We must learn to see through the eyes of faith. Faith is the ability to see what is coming, even when it's not here. It's the ability to believe that the impossible is possible when God is with us. When God is with us, a seemingly impossible is possible. It's the ability to focus in on the promise instead of the problems. The ten could only see the problems. They could only see the pitfall. Only the two had the ability to see the potential and to see the promise. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is why did the mission fail so horribly? And I believe that it was rooted in a lack of faith. God says to Moses, send shlach lecha, send for yourself. There's a passage in Deuteronomy that we'll look at in a moment where Moses actually is talking to the children. He says, you came to me and said we should send spies out in the land and it seemed good to me so I agreed that we could do it. They weren't sending these spies because God needed them to send the spies. Send for yourself. The people lacked faith, right? They were kind of uncertain. They're like, man, we heard good things about this land. You know, from the days of Abraham down, we've been told about this awesome land. But you know what they say? Seeing is believing. So we better go see for ourselves what this land is really like. And we want to see for ourselves, you know, who is living in the land? Is it really going to be possible for us to take the land? So I think the request was really just masking their lack of faith and trust in the Lord. They were not willing to just rely on the Lord and his promises alone. They wanted more answers 
Even though God said the land was good, the Lord said it was theirs, they still wanted to know more. This is what Deuteronomy 1 confirms. Then I said to you, verse 22, Then all of you came to me and said, Let us send men ahead to spy out the land for us and bring back a report about the route we are to take and the towns we were to come to. And it, the idea seemed good to me, so I selected 12 of you, one from each tribe. We must learn to discern between a good idea and a God idea. It was a good idea, but it wasn't a God idea. They lacked a discernment. They lacked a trust. And when God says, I'm giving it to you, you don't need to analyze it and inspect it and try and maneuver it around. We're to receive it by faith. And that's why one of the, it says one of the things that, again, God says to, Moses says to the people, he says in, in Deuteronomy 1, verse 39, he says, And the little ones that you said would be taken captive, your children who do not know good or bad, they will enter the land, and I will give it to them, and they will take possession of it. So the very ones, the little ones, the children who the parents are worried about, man, if we go and try and take the land, our children are going to be captured. The little ones are going to be the ones to receive it. Why? It's what Jesus says in the New Testament. He says, unless you receive the kingdom like a what? Child, you won't enter. What he's saying is that we need to, if we're going to enter into the fullness of God's promises and plans and provision for us, what type of faith do we have to have a what? childlike faith. Why a childlike faith? Listen, if I tell, if I tell Judah the tooth fairy is real, he's going to believe the tooth fairy is real. It's great. I don't have teenagers yet. My kids believe Stephanie and I. When we say something is how it is, okay, mom and dad says it. It is how it is. You know, they trust us. It's like, it's like when Judah wants to do something scary, and, you know, when we were, we were out in the ocean, he's like, Dad, I'm only going to come in if you come out with me. Why? Because he knows he's scared, but if he knows if I'm there, it's safe. But if I tell him it's safe, he doesn't question it. If Dad or Mom says it's safe, it's safe. He takes us at our word. There's no question. There's no deliberation. There's no, if mom and dad love me, they want what's best for me. They're not going to let anything happen to me. If they say it's safe, if they say it's good, it's good. That's the childlike faith God wants his people to have. Not, well, thank you for the offer, Lord. Uh, let me take a look at it myself. And if it seems good to me, if I like it, then I'll be happy to receive it. When God offers us a gift, we don't, we don't ask to inspect it. We don't, we don't ask to say, well, you know, let me think about it. Let me pray on it. I'll get back to you in the morning. It's faith to risk, faith to believe. And I think one of the things the, the spies wanted to do, one of the reasons why they wanted to spend spies in the land is because they wanted to minimize the risk and manage the risk. And how many times has God asked us to do something, but we want to manage the risk, right? We want to manage the potential downside if things don't go the way we expect. And when God asks us to do something, we have to have the faith. And I think one of the real fears of the spies was that they were going to have to do something. Think about it. God is trying to break them of their slave mentality, as slaves in Egypt, they didn't have to worry about their housing, their clothing, their food. All of that was provided. Now they're in the wilderness. God is providing bread from heaven. He's protecting them supernaturally. He, they didn't have to fight any of their enemies to come out of slavery. God did it all for them. Why? Because they were like children. They were not mature enough or strong enough in faith to do it on their own. They needed God to just be their daddy, and to just take care of all of their needs for them. But now they had grown and matured to the point where we have to go from being infants to becoming spiritual adults. So now as God says, listen, I'm going to give you the land, but listen, I'm just not going to give it to you. You're going to have to partner with me to go in and take the land. I'm going to fight with you, but you're still going to have to fight. 
You're going to go up. I'm going to go up with you, but you got to go up. You're not just going to have it handed to you on a silver platter. You have to begin to walk out your faith and walk in the promises and partner with me to see it come to pass. And this terrified them. For the first time, they were actually going to have to roll up their sleeves and, and actually participate. And this scared them. But the reality was that the mission was training for reigning. He want, God was offering them a promotion. God doesn't want us just to be passive our whole life. He wants us to be a partner. And so he tells his 12 spies, go in, sit, take the land. And here's an interesting thing. How many of you guys know that Joshua's name isn't actually Joshua? His name biblically is not Joshua. It's Hosea. God adds a letter, the letter Yud, the smallest letter to, the na- to his name in this passage, Numbers 13, and calls him Yehoshua. Before he goes and it takes the land, Moses changes Hosea, Joshua's name to Joshua. Why? Why the letter Yud? Because number one, the letter Yud is equal to the number 10 in Hebrew. So think about it. Joshua's going to have to stand up against the what? The 10 spies. He needed the courage and the strength to stand against the 10. But why the letter Yud? The letter Yud is the first letter of God's name. yud heh vav Hey. Right, Jehovah, Yahweh, however you want to pronounce it. So he adds a letter. He adds God's, the first letter of God's name is added to Joshua's name. But, but the letter Yud is also seen as the power of God concentrated in the smallest point possible. So it's this idea that God can do a little with a much. It's also seen as the spark of the Messiah. After all, the first letter of the name of Jesus in Hebrew is what? Yeshua. It's the letter Yud. So he has a letter of first letter of Messiah's name to his name. And signifies God's presence in every point of reality. What Moses was saying to, to, to Joshua was saying, listen, God has attached his name to you. Like he's attached his name to this people. Like he's attached his name to this promise. God is near. Don't fear. How many of you know if God's the co-signer on the check, you don't have to worry about it bouncing, right? If God is behind the promise, you don't have to worry about it not coming to pass. So they go into the land, and, and they give this account. They, we went up to the land to which you sent us, verse 27 of chapter 13, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's its fruits. Are you ready? 28. But... Should I say that again? But, in Hebrew, Ephes. Can you say Ephes? Ephes. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and large. We saw the descendants of Anak there. The Malachites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites in the hill country. The Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Friends, everything went to pot when they stuck their big butts into the middle of it. Friends, whenever we come to the Lord with our big butts, we're going to get in trouble. But Lord, but God. Friends, if we, if God gives us a promise, if he gives us a purpose, if he gives us direction, and we try and stick our butts in the way, we were always going to get in the pr- trouble. And the Hebrew word there for but is ephes. You know what it literally means? It literally means nothing. The land is flowing with milk and honey. It means nothing to us because there's giants in the land. So, yeah, it's good. Okay. So, what? What does that mean to us? It's not like we're ever going to be able to enjoy it. It's not like we're going to ever be able to take hold of it. It's not like it's, the promise is ever going to come past. It's like nothing. And how we perceive God and his gifts to us is critical to faith, trust, and blessing. This is what Yeshua says in Luke chapter 9. 11, chapter 11, verse 9. I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will knock and the door will be opened. Which of a father, which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a steak instead? 
Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give to you the Holy Spirit who asks him? Do we really think God is going to make us an offer and make us a promise, and somehow he's going to pull the rug out from under us? Like, man, like, 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 you know, it's kind of like one of those game show. All this could be yours and more if the price is right, right? I mean, it's like, does God, like, make us this offer just to, like, torment us and to tease us? Like, oh, man, here's this promise that he dangles in front of us. But you know what? You're never going to get it. You're never going to have enough faith. You're never going to. It's too good to be true. That's not how God is with us. He's a loving father. He gives us every blessing, including the spirit without measure. The question is, do we trust him? And part of what we have to understand is that we have to move from fear to faith and from faith to trust. They were living out of fear. The ten were living out of fear and not out of faith. And then they had to go from faith to trust because you can have faith but not have trust. Faith is knowing something is true. Trust is believing it's true to the point of willing to be able to act on it. There's plenty of us know that God, there's plenty of us like know certain things, but we don't step out in faith. Faith without works is dead. If you really believe it, you have to walk it out and begin to put it into practice, right? There's 12 in the boat. Only one has the faith as well as the trust to say, hey, can I step out of the boat and come walking to you on the water? Having faith without trust is trying to learn how to swim while leaving one foot on the ground. Won't happen, right? If you're not willing to step out of the boat, if you're not willing to go into the land, you know, then it's not going to work. And part of the biggest issue is oftentimes we have faith without trust. And the giants, because the truth is, right, each, there's always going to be giants. But giants aren't meant to instill fear. They're meant to build our faith. The giants in the land were not there to terrify the people and to put, put fear into them. They weren't there to put panic into them. God brings giants into our life to build our faith and our trust in him because he wants us to have a giant-sized faith. He wants to grow us without the giants, without the problems, without the struggles that we face. We're not going to have the overcoming faith that's going to help us endure to the end and see the breakthrough and blessing that God wants us to see. The giants aren't meant to teach us to live in the shadow of fear, but to live in the light of God's faithfulness. And the question that we have to ask ourselves today is, what are the giants in your life that he wants you to face? Because too many times, like in the days of David, we're like the Israelites who are cowering in our tents because Goliath is out there roaming around. Everyone was living in fear of the giant. But we're not called to live in fear of the giant. God created us to be giant slayers. We're called to be overcomers. And I got to tell you, there are a lot of giants in our world today. I mean, there's the giant of the economic challenges that we're facing. Right? You look at Greece. Oh, my goodness. The whole, the whole economy could crumble, right, of Greece. And who knows what that will do to Europe and consumer confidence in the stock market. There's the Middle East. There's the conflict between Jews and Arabs. There's the growing anti-Israel, anti-Semitic attitudes and actions. There's talk about allowing Iran to have nuclear capabilities. There's domestic terrorism. Think about what happened, the the sentencing of the Boston bomber and what happened there, and then the horrible atrocity that happened in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, where where hate-filled races could walk into a church and open fire. And then there's the terrorist attack in Tunisia and the unrest throughout the Middle East and in Europe. And then there's the Supreme Court decision this week legalizing gay marriage. And it's easy to look out of all of this out of fear and instead of faith and trust. There's giants out there. So what? 
there's always been giants in the land. There's always been giants in the land. So what are we scared of? So fear is what motivated the 10. And I think sometimes some of us start, some of us, and when we see all these things, it's talking with Pastor Jonathan, start focusing on the end of the world and we start running to doom and gloom. Oh my God, America's coming to an end. The world is coming to an end. Let's store up ammunition and food. And oh my God, it's coming to an end. There's nothing we can do. We just have to hold on and pray the Lord comes quickly. Friends, no. We start becoming focused on the end in an unhealthy way. And we start living out of fear, and we throw up our hands and say, oh, this is what the Bible speaks of. This is the beginning of the great apostrophe. There's nothing that we could do. It's, let's forget it. You know, all we can do is just get in our holy huddles and pray, and we become fear-driven and not faith-driven. And we become on the defensive instead of on the offenses where Messiah doesn't say, you know, but you, you know, it, doesn't, it's not, it doesn't say this. He says, well, pray really hard and the, and the gates of Hades will not be able to defeat you. No, he says, we're going to be able to defeat the gates of Hades. We're going to run to the door, the door and knock it down. You know, I was in Israel. And I, and I was sharing a little bit about what we're doing here with, with the sand and fusion and span with, some, with, the, with the family in Israel. And one of, the members of the, one of the family members said this. He said, man, I said, I said, we're believing that God wants to bring revival, but we're believing he just says revival happens from the bottom up, but we also want to see revival with Reformation where culture is transformed. God using the arts and entertainment and, and politics and business, he wants to transform nations he wants to transform culture and the guy looked at me and says yeah I don't believe that he goes I, do, I don't think it's possible and I was like you don't I was like you don't think he's like no it's in, things are too far gone for that to happen I've got no faith or hope for that I'm thinking you've got no faith or hope that we could transform the world that we can significantly impact culture, that we can see nations turn to the Lord. Listen, I'll be honest with you. I'll die before I go to that place. That's a place of fear and negativity. I will go to the grave with my last breath and, and my last thought believing that we can change the world. <laughs> Period. Period. I'm not going to ever stop believing that. What are we supposed to do? Just throw up our hands and give up? We're supposed to have the type of faith, listen, that, that believes against the odds, that believes against everything in the face of the natural. It's to believe that we can overcome the giants. Listen, no one thought that a guy could die on a cross and rise three days later either. No one thought that either. I mean, we believe some crazy stuff. God can do some crazy stuff. Listen, he took a people that was slaves in Egypt that was the strongest, most powerful nation, and he brought a slave people out of it and used them to become a light to the world. God does crazy stuff. And I got to tell you, what happens is when we live out of fear, we go to a place of cynicism. And this is one of the greatest things that is plaguing the body of Messiah today and our culture in general is this attitude of cynicism. And cynicism says this, either things can't change or they're not worth changing. Let me tell you something. There is nothing more antithetical to the promises of God and of the gospel than, an, than, than, the, than a cynical belief that nothing can change. God is all about change, right? I believe, in the, I believe the gospel is the power of God to salvation, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Behold, you are a new creation. The old has passed and the new has come. It's all about change. So I reject and refuse this way of thinking, this negative, destructive way of seeing the world that destroys our ability to impact it for the kingdom. This cynical way of seeing is completely antithetical to the power of God and the salvation that he offers us through his son. 
Friends, we are messengers of the gospel. We're agents of reconciliation. We're ambassadors for a Messiah. And as such, we are called to effect change and transformation in people's lives. Period. And here's the reality. We might not be able to complete the work. We might not even have the type of success by worldly standards. But you know what? We're not free to desist from it either. Just because we can't do everything that we believe that God would want us to do, just because we can't see every promise come to pass, we are not free to desist from going after it, for believing for it, for fighting for it, for trying to impact lives, for trying to proclaim the good news, for trying to see hope restored. Right. Amen. <laughs> And I believe we have become irrelevant. The body of Messiah, the church, the people of faith often become irrelevant because we lose our prophetic voice. We lose our prophetic voice. And a prophetic voice is a voice that speaks truth to power in love that actively works to see the values and the reality of God's kingdom established on earth as it is in heaven. This is what drives me. This is what motivates me. We're called to be a prophetic voice, not a pathetic voice. <laughs> prophetic, not pathetic. Let me tell you when we become a pathetic voice. When we become like the spies. They were a pathetic voice. Oh, man, there's giants in the land. Let's give up. It doesn't mean anything. Let's, let's go back to Egypt. Then there's the prophetic voice of Joshua and Caleb. The pathetic voice is a passive voice that wants to give up. It's a pathetic voice that wants to give in. It looks at the giants and it says, you know what it says? It says, I am just a grasshopper. I am powerless. I'm just one person. How can I change anything? Does my voice really matter? Does my vote really matter? Does, do, does, my, does my little action mean anything? You know, I can't really change. That's the pathetic voice. Yes, it does matter. Listen, if the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, you are an army of one. Right? I mean... You have something in you. Yes, but too often believers of the body of Messiah are afraid of the giants, and we've lost our relevancy because we've lost our prophetic voice and sense of mission. I was talking to a friend this week. His name is Jeff. Jeff is one of the leaders of the most significant African-American ministry in the nation called Urban Ministries International, providing resources of Bibles, a Sunday school curriculum, VBS, media, books, to 40,000 African-American churches, some of the most significant ones as well as just the average ones in our nation. And he was on the call with the top leaders, some of the top leaders, top evangelical leaders, people like Tim Keller from Redeemer and just uh, 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 who's who of individuals. And they said to him, Jeff, you know, what, what, what do we do in face of Charleston, in face of these accusations and all this stuff? And you know what Jeff said? He said, listen, he said, he said Jeff, what are you going to do? And he says, you know what? I'm not going to do anything. He goes, you know whose responsibility is? It's your responsibility. He said, it's time for the white church, the white segment of the church in this nation to rise up and to condemn racism and discrimination. It's not for me, it's for you to make your voices heard. Yeah, and here's the reality. We, when the, the civil rights movement was probably one of the greatest opportunities for God's people to arise and to be who God calls us to be. But you know what? The white evangelical church fell asleep at the wheel, and for the most part, we missed it. We missed it. There is an opportunity again to stand against racism and discrimination and to say, you know what? We're not putting up with it, right? 
But we tend to be more focused on doctrine than ethics, more focused on faith rather than works, more concerned with not rocking the boat than getting out of the boat out of desire to expand our communities and, to, and, to, and, and not offend people. But you know what? Black lives matter. There's a historic problem with racism and discrimination in our nation. Although it's much better than what it was, there's still an aspect of institutional racism in a lot of parts of our country. And we need to own it. And we need to admit it. And we need to stand against it. Listen, 11 a.m. on Sunday morning is still one of the most segregated hours of the week in most places in our nation. It's one of the reasons why we do fusion. We believe, and that's one of the reasons why we're proud of this community. We believe in all the kingdom is every color, every ethnic group, Jew and Gentile coming together to worship the king. That's what we have to be about. Why do we have to fight racism and discrimination? Why do we have to be concerned about the economic plight of the poorest in our communities? Because there's no poverty in the kingdom. Because there's no racism in the kingdom. Because there's no discrimination in the kingdom. And if that exists in our communities, then we have a responsibility to break it down and to go after it. That's why I'm excited that we partner with Urban Ministries International and our, our, you know, because, you know, they've asked us to come in and to help them create content and to help them do different things. And, yeah, it's not like we don't have enough to do. But, listen, if we say we're about unity, if we say it's about coming together, then you know what that means? And part of the way you build unity, the part of the way you demonstrate love is you serve other people. If we say we are committed to our brothers and sisters across ethnic lines, then I have to serve the African-American community in some way, right? We have to serve these different ethnic communities. If we say we really care and we say we're really committed to seeking the blessing, then we have to roll up our sleeves and do something. And so I'm blessed. I'm I'm glad that we have a more of a multi-ethnic community here because it models the kingdom. But that's the beginning. It's not the end. And it's way too easy to become like the spies and respond out of fear. And the truth is, once we respond out of fear, we begin to go negative. We begin to go negative. Fear will drive you to seeing things out of the bad eye. The bad eye is the negative eye. Whether it's, oh my God, the, the sky is falling, the nation is doomed, the world's coming to an end, run for the hills, you know, whatever this is. Or, or, or when we fear or when we see from the bad eye, we begin to act in a way that's not in line with the faith, hope, and love that Messiah wants us to respond with. And so listen, the, the ruling comes down in support of, uh, support of uh, gay, gay marriage in the nation. And here's the reality. No matter what your position on this is, the reality is if we respond out of meanness, if we respond out of harshness, if we respond in an ungodly, judgmental way out of fear, you know what? We're not going to honor the Lord in the midst of it. So look... Here's the reality. My, I do have a concern. My concern is this. Listen, we live in a country. People deserve not to be persecuted. They deserve to be able to live their lives as they see fit as long as it doesn't hurt other people, right? But, here's the, but my concern for this situation is there is the potential, and we've seen it happen. I was just in Israel, and there's a community there called Yad Hashmona that is a messianic kibbutz in Israel, and because, they, because they, they hold to certain biblical values that they believe are biblical values, they would not allow a, 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 a gay wedding on their, mar- on, their, on their property, and therefore they, they, they went to the Supreme Court. They couldn't have any weddings there now. And, so the con- and there's been situations here. So the concern is this, is that how do we balance, how do we balance the rights, the different rights of people? How do we do so that one group doesn't gain rights and one group loses rights? How do we respect everyone's rights? How do we honor the rights of, of the LGBT community 
and yet honor the rights of people of faith who might agree. I mean, there's people that have faith that agree and those who disagree with it. But how do we honor everyone's rights and not strip one person's rights at the expense of the other? And that's the challenge of what we're going to have to deal with in this nation. And there's going to be challenges with it. But the question is, how are we going to respond? Even with people that we, whether we agree with them or don't agree with them, whatever the side of the coin that you fall on, my concern is the reality is partially this. Part of the reality is this, is that part of the reason why the LGBT community is, so, is going after Christians uh, in certain ways is because of the fact that many times throughout the years, we have responded to them in ways that are harsh and disrespectful. Because we responded out of fear and not out of love. And so no matter what our position is, we never have a right not to respond out of love. We don't vilify people. We love them. We can disagree but still honor them. And that connects us back to another passage in the book of Numbers. Adonai said to Moses, I know some of you might be ready to stone me, but that's okay. <laughs> stone me afterwards. Come and ask me afterwards. Adonai said to Moses, Take the staff, assemble the people, the community, and Aaron, your brother, before their eyes. Tell the rock to produce this water. You will bring them water out of the rock, and thus enable the community and their livestock to bring, drink. Moses took the staff in the presence of the Lord and he, as he ordered them. But after Moses and Aaron had assembled the community in front of the rock, he said to them, Listen here, you rebels. Are, you supposed, are, are we supposed to bring water from this rock? Then Moses raised his hand and hit the rock twice with the staff, and water flowed in abundance. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me, and so as to cause me to be not sanctified in the midst of the people, you will not bring this community into the land. Man, Moses makes one mistake, and he can't go into the land. It says Moses didn't believe. What does it mean that Moses didn't believe when he struck the rock? There's many different interpretations. Some say he was supposed to speak to the rock. He struck the rock. That was obviously not what God, he didn't do what God said. Some say because of, his set, because of what he said, um, because he said, are we going to bring water from this rock for you? He was taking credit that really God deserved. He was taking more credit than he should. But let me tell you something. Moses could be called his nickname, the striker. Because Moses enters on to the scene by striking. Right? How does Moses begin his leadership of the people? He struck the Egyptian who was persecuting the people. He tried to stop two Hebrews from striking each other. Then when God calls him back to redeem Israel, the first thing he does is what? Strike the Nile, and it turns to blood. When he brings Israel out of Egypt, Exodus 17, they need water from the rock, and what does God say to Moses? Strike the rock. Why is it this time is it not okay for him to strike the rock? He, 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 he desecrates the name of God and exhibits a lack of faith. What was it? that he did that was so upsetting, that was so wrong, that he gets disqualified from taking the people into the land. I believe it's all the above potentially, but it's this thing for sure. Moses had always been the advocate for the people. Even when he struck the Egyptian the first time, he struck it out of love and concern for his Hebrew brothers and sisters, for the children of Israel. Whenever God was like, I'm going to destroy them and start over, Moses like, no, Father, you know, you can't do that. These are your children. You have a covenant. He was always a defender of the people. He always had faith in the people. He always saw the best in the people. But after the sin of the, after everything that happened, including the sin of the spies, for, when they complain again, before him, Moses loses faith in the people. And he says, you rebels. 
See, right? There's a difference between saying to your child, man, that was something bad that you did versus saying you are bad. There's a difference between someone's actions and their essence. And Moses lost the ability to see the best in the people. He lost the ability to see the good in the people. He became so frustrated, so angry, they were now all rebels. He couldn't lead the people into the land. The striking of the rock is understood on a, on a, on a metaphorical level and that the rock, Israel is called the rock. One of the names of Israel is the rock. By him striking the rock, it was like he was striking the people. God said, speak to the rock, not strike the rock. What is he saying? That we don't try and overcome people, that we don't try and make our position the main position, that we don't try and, and, and gain influence over people by using verbal force or physical might to dominate them. That's not the way of the Lord. He humbled himself. He emptied himself. And so what happens is, is that it says faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is what? See, here's what happens. When you lose faith in someone, you lose hope in them. When you lose hope in them, hope is the belief that the that the future can be different. When you lose faith in someone, you, 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 you lose hope, and that means, I don't think this person will ever change. This person will never be different. They're always going to be, they're always going to keep doing the same thing. They're never going to change. This is pointless. When you lose faith and hope in people, you lose love. And when you lose love, you come in the opposite spirit, which is anger and frustration. And so instead of speaking correction and direction to them, what do you do? You become verbally forceful and physically strong with them. And you try and manhandle them and manipulate them and force them into the right way that you want them to go. And whether it's with raising children or whether it's leading people, when you lose faith and you lose hope in them, you lose the right to lead them. Because here's the thing. Leaders, whether they be a mother and the father in the family, whether it be a teacher in a, a school, whether it be the president of a nation, whether it be the pastor or rabbi of the community, we are meant to be a reflection of the, of the, of the heart of God and his power and authority. And when we abuse that and misrepresent the heart and character of God by harshness, by force and manipulation, we lose the essence of what it means to be a servant leader. And when Moses did that, and all he could see was a group of rebels and not anything else, he was no longer fit to lead them or take them in to the land. His vision became blurred. He could only see the negative. A bunch of spoiled, rebellious kvetchers and at that point, he lost hope. And he responded out of anger and frustration. And as individuals and as leaders, we have to guard against this. Yeshua, Jesus says, Matthew 5, 24, but I tell you, anyone who nurses anger against his brother will be subject to judgment, that whoever calls his brother you good for nothing will be brought to the Sanhedrin. Whoever says racha, fool, incurs the penalty of burning fire. We don't treat people like that. It's not how God treats us. He's gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness. So what type of faith do we have? Do we have a grasshopper faith or do we have a giant-sized faith? The faith, God, amen, hopefully. The faith of a grasshopper minimizes God and maximizes the obstacles. 
The faith of a grasshopper makes us see ourselves as small and insignificant. The faith of a grasshopper always has excuses and says but. Always focuses and sees the negative. Always agrees with the crowd. Discourages others from stepping into their promise. Wants to bring people down with them. Agrees with lies and falsehoods. Is rooted in false understanding of who God is. Does not see God as good or great. Does not see God as being big enough. Does not not appreciate the blessings that we are offered, wants to go back to Egypt, which is the old way of being, the old way of seeing, the old paradigms, does not listen to the Lord, goes when they should stay, and stays when God says go, and that type of grasshopper faith will cause us to die in the desert, to lose our voice, to become irrelevant, and the only ones that we will affect is maybe no one. A giant-sized faith is different, and we'll close with this. It's the spirit of Caleb and Joshua. But my servant Caleb has a ruach achar, a different spirit, and follows me wholeheartedly, and I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. I don't know about you. I want to be a Caleb. I want to be a Joshua. I want to live by faith, not by fear. Joshua at 80 years old, right? What does he say? He says to Moses, no, he said, no, Caleb comes to Joshua, 80 years old, and he says, listen, God promised me that I would, I'm, he says, I'm as, I was 40 years old when Moses sent us into land. He says, I'm as strong today and ready for war as I was that day. He says, I want to go in there and give me Hebron. I want to drive them out. What was Hebron? Why did he ask for Hebron? Why that particular place? That's the place where they saw the giants. So he's 80 years old. He says, I want the toughest assignment. I don't want the easy assignment. Give me the place of the giants, the place where the fear began, the place where they lost faith. Send me there now, Lord. I'm going to take the land. And he named the, and he named Hebron, and he named the city Hebron, which was formerly called Kiryat Arba. Why? Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. He says, I want the toughest guy. I'll take him out. Because the faith of a giant, a God-sized faith, is an active faith. It's a faith, it, faith is a substance of hope, and hope awakens faith. Faith is coming to an agreement with God and saying, I believe what God says, and I take him at his word. The proof of hope, our faith is hope. Without faith, without faith and hope, we only have a wish. But when we have hope and faith in God, we're powerful. Unbelief honors what we see as impossible. Faith honors God and believes all things as possible. Hope looks to the future while faith lays hope of the present. Faith and hope. Faith says, faith says I can do it now. And hope says, but it's going to be even better in the future. So, Lord, we just thank you. We invite the worship team back up. Lord, we just thank you right now, and we bless you in the name of Yeshua. Give us the faith of giants. Lord, I pray that you'd break off any of that spirit of the grasshopper from us. And I'm asking today, Lord, that if we're living in fear, that we would move to faith and trust. And I'm asking God that you'd give us back our voice, that we speak the truth, the power, and love, that we would not remain silent, but that whatever we do, we would always honor and respect. God, give us the courage to face the problems and the pitfalls that are in front of us, not to be sucked in to this negative way of thinking. But we know most importantly that our faith is only as good as the one whom we put our faith in. And we thank you, Lord, that you sent your son, Yeshua, to conquer the biggest giant, death, sin, and the enemy. And that when we place our faith in your son, we experience the good 
we experience the life and we experience the blessing. And so today, if you've never turned to him and placed your faith in him, turn to Messiah because he will give you a conquering faith that overcomes the world and everything in it. Because the one whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And that freedom includes freedom from giants and fear and everything else that might haunt us. So we bless you now in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Just stand for a minute.